I'm Eric Eastup, the pastor of Village Church, and I want to thank you for once again joining with us for online worship. Uh, But before we get started, just have a couple of things that I would like to share with you. Uh, If you are interested in getting maybe some more information about the church, we want you to be able to feel free to do that. And so what you can do is you can take your phone and you can text VC Welcome to 94090 and just fill out that form and we will make sure that this week that you get some information about the church. Uh, The other thing is I am really excited. Uh, This weekend we are starting our drive-in worship services on site at Village Church but beginning the very first Sunday in June we are going to have Saturday night drive-in service But Sunday mornings, we're going to have a worship service inside at 9 o'clock and at 10.30. And if you would like some more information about that, you can go to our website at BlythewoodVillage.com and you can get some more information about what's going to be taking place, you know, how we're going to social distance and those types of things. But more than anything, I am just excited that, that God's people are going to be gathering together under one roof together again and so I'm really looking forward to that day I think it's going to be I think it's really just going to be a special day so that will start June the 7th Uh, but before we get started with our time of worship with our band leading us I just want to open us up in a word of prayer and just pray for God to speak to your heart today so why don't you pray with me Heavenly Father I am grateful uh, for a new day that you've given us Uh, God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. I am so grateful, God, in the way that you have have watched over us, the way that you have blessed us. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will just use this time today to speak into us. And we are looking at the promises of God. And uh, so, Jesus, I pray that we will be encouraged as we realize that as we are going through just a, a time of uncertainty, Lord, there are some things that we can be certain about. And that is the promises that you give. Jesus, bless this day. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and may your heart be blessed today. Why don't you stand and join us in your living room at home and worship as we praise our Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for 
rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony Who oh, I'm alive This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony oh. appreciate the village worship team playing for us again so it's it, whenever they do it just it just reminds me that things are beginning to move back into some normalcy in our worship together uh, but today we are continuing our series 2020 keeping an eye on the promises of God and so we've la over the last couple of weeks we've seen a couple of the promises that God has for his people God has has given us a promise that he will fight for us. God has given us a promise that he will be with us. And today we're going to be looking at another one of the promises of God, and that is that God forgives us. So if you have your Bible, we're just going to look at one verse today. It's uh, 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to look in verse number 9. Uh, but before we, we get started, uh, I, I, and, and with the sermon, there's one thing that I know. I know that there are a lot of people who struggle with the idea of boundaries. Uh, anytime we see boundaries, I believe it is in our human nature to do whatever we can to get around them or to go over them. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I think that's true really in, with, with all of creation. Um, if you have a dog and you build a fence or you have a fence in your yard, you have that fence in there so that your, your dog can enjoy uh, some space with safety. Yeah, you don't want him running out into the road getting hit by a car, but here's what I've noticed about the dogs we've had over the years. Whenever we've had a fence, I can tell you where our dog would spend most of his time. It was right up against the fence. He wasn't enjoying the freedom he had. He was just looking to see how in the world he could get over that boundary. And every time I'd see my dog out there, I'd think, man, that dog is, is such a moron. Uh, but you know what? People are the same way. I read a story about a guy uh, in San Francisco. He was driving his Porsche 911, and he was going to take his regular shortcut when he noticed that there were some cones up blocking off traffic. Well, he went around the cones, and what he did not realize is that they were laying out a new concrete sidewalk, and he ended up driving around, driving right into that wet cement, and his car sunk down in it. And it took him hours to extricate his car from that concrete. And I saw that and I thought, well, he, that guy got exactly what he deserved. That's what happens when you go around boundaries. But, you know, I, I am grateful that, that God is not going to treat me that way when it comes to me breaking the boundaries that he set up in my life. Because I've broken God's boundaries numerous times, as have you. Uh, we all have. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, today we are looking at one of the promises of God, and that is that God forgives, even whenever we step over his boundaries. But today in our scripture, we're going to see that there is a process that comes with God's forgiveness. Now, I think we all like the idea of forgiveness, but we just want to receive forgiveness without having to make any changes, without us really having to do anything. But our, our verse we're looking at today shows us that there's actually a process that comes with forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is not free. There was a cost that came with it. As a matter of fact, we are told in 1 John 1, 7, it says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Why? Well, it's the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Hebrews 9.15 says, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who were called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under 
the first covenant. So forgiveness is not free. And so that's why we're looking in 1 John chapter 1 in verse number 9. And at this time, the background is that there was a group of teachers who were saying when you become a follower of Jesus, that it, it doesn't, after that, it doesn't matter how you live, it doesn't matter what you do, that, that God's going to forgive you anyway, that everything's okay. And, and in, in one sense, that's true. Uh, that, that when you are forgiven, when you belong to God, that, you're, that you are his, that you are his forever. But it's not true that you can just willfully and free, freely live in sin, and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's a way for us to rationalize sin away. It's a way for us to use Jesus like he's some sort of fire insurance policy. So that's why John wrote this verse here, to let us know that there's a process that comes with forgiveness. And that was true for them in this text. It's true for us today. So, so what is the process of forgiveness? Well, the first part of the process of forgiveness is it starts with confession. Uh, for there to be forgiveness, there has to be confession. And, and I want you to look with me in verse number 9. And here's what it says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, forgiveness is not just automatic. You know, it's not like we can stay outside of God's boundaries and then say, oh, it doesn't really matter if I do or not, because regardless, I am forgiven. Uh, if that were true, then there would not be the first word that is mentioned in verse number 9. Now, if you look in verse number 9, what, what is the first word in verse number 9? It is the word, if. If we confess our sins. Uh, that word if shows that we have a choice concerning our forgiveness. If we desire to have it, John says, then you will do this. What will we do? We will confess. We will confess our sins. Uh, the word confess, it simply means to admit we're doing wrong. It means to take personal responsibility for stepping outside of the boundaries that God has set up for us. Uh, that means that, uh, that I can't slough off my sin and say it's no big deal. I can't, you know, just act like sin doesn't matter and say things like this. Well, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, boys are going to be boys. Or we can't make the excuse, well, you know, I'm Irish. And because I'm Irish, this is just the way I naturally act, and, but it's okay with God. I, I can't say, well, you know, this is the way I grew up and that these are the circumstances I was in. And so, you know, I just have a natural propensity to do these things outside of God's boundaries, but it, but it doesn't really matter. Well, if, if I want forgiveness, then I have to confess my sin. And, and the word confess, another meaning of it is it means that you're going to call sin the same thing that God does. Now, now how does God view sin? Well, God hates sin. And, and he hates sin because of what it does to us. It separates us from God. In Psalm 66, 18, it says, if I have sin in my heart, or if I harbor sin in my heart, it says, God will not hear me. You see, God hates sin because it destroys us in our relationship with him, and it ends up leading us to, to spiritual death and also to physical death. You know, I, I've always heard it said that the first step to sobriety is, is, is to quit being in denial. It is to admit what you are. You know, when an AA meeting begins and people introduce themselves, they, they say, I am so-and-so and I am an alcoholic. Now, the reason why they do that is they're saying there's no excuses. This is who I am. I recognize it. There has to be a recognition of our sinfulness before it can ever be dealt with. I mean, does that make sense? You know, I, I, I'll make a confession to you. Um, since I've been married, whenever, as well, whenever Emily and I first got married, there's a show that she would watch every Saturday evening, and I would watch it with her, and I actually kind of enjoyed it. And uh, it, it was the show called What Not to Wear. It's a fashion show. I mean, this is like me telling you John Wayne likes ballet, I know. But, uh, but it was a fashion show, and the, the basis behind it was people would be nominated by friends and family uh, who, and because they didn't dress well, and they needed help, you know, stylistically or with their fashion. Uh, but it was amazing to me that the, when they would have these professionals that would come and tell them how to dress, a lot of them were just in complete denial. Uh, and typically it was somebody, you know, usually like in their 40s or 50s, you know, like my age. And, and they, they liked dressing like they were teenagers because they thought it made them look younger. 
Well, I can tell you right now, it doesn't. And the professionals would tell them this, but many times they would ignore them. And I thought that's what a lot of us do with God. You know, we, we want to hang on so badly to the way that we want to live, to what we think is right and what we think is wrong, that we will ignore God's leadership to keep doing what we want to do. But when we do that, y'all, it, it is absolutely not helpful. It's, it's destructive. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And, and our denial and disobedience to God, eventually, it, it finds us out. In Numbers 32, 23, it says that your sins will find you out. That's why at Village Church, we, we want to teach the Bible. You know, we, we want to teach God's Word we, because we believe that God's Word, it is like a light that shines on us and it exposes our sin. Now, we don't want to expose sin so that we can look at other people and say, I can't believe how terrible you are. You know, I can't believe that you would do that. Uh, we want sin to be exposed so that, so that we can see it and that we can acknowledge it and confess it to God. Because that is the first part of the process of forgiveness. It's confession. But another part of the process of forgiveness with God is substitution. And, and again, you can see this in verse number 9. It says, if we confess our sins, it says, He is faithful and just, or He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of my favorite characteristics of God is that He's loving I am so grateful that God is loving. Because if God was not loving, I can tell you right now, I would be one smoking heap. I would be in trouble. Now, I'm so grateful that God is loving because there is another characteristic of God that I think many of us want to avoid and ignore. It says our God is loving, but the Bible here in verse number 9 says that our God is also righteous. And that word righteous means just. He is a just God. Now, I love justice when it's for other people. I, I Personally, I don't want justice to be brought down on me. And, and, and I think the reason, and I think many of you are the same way. And the reason why is because we understand deep within us that we are not just, that we are not righteous. Now, I know there are some people who say, well, I'm a really good person. I don't agree with that. Well, then you need to be reminded of what James 2.10 says. It says, for whoever keeps the entire law yet fails at one point, just one, says he is guilty of breaking all of it. Now, make no mistake. We are all guilty, and God is just, and God requires that his law be kept. Now, that's bad news for us, because no one is, can perfectly keep the law of God. But here's the good news. And the good news is that God, because he is loving, he made provision for us. That's why he sent Jesus into this world for us. He became our substitute. He died in our place. Uh, Romans 8, 1 through 4 points this out very clearly. It says, Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And what the law could not do since it was limited by the flesh, it says God did. And he condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in flesh like ours under sin's domain and as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, now do you see that in these verses? What it's pointing out is that forgiveness is possible for us because Christ stepped into our place and he took the punishment of sin for us that we might live. Whenever Garrett Griffin turned 21, he wanted to do a skydiving jump, a tandem skydiving jump. And so he got in a small plane. They went up 12,000 feet in the air. He had an instructor with him. And he and this, the instructor jumped out of the plane. And whenever they jumped out of the plane, you know, they're falling towards the earth. And the instructor, they're, you know, they're, they're tied together. The instructor pulled the ripcord. And when he did, the chute did not come out. 
So he pulled the emergency ripcord, and as he pulled it for the second shoot, it didn't open either. And, and there were no more shoots left. And so they were hurtling down to the ground towards their deaths when right at the last moment, right before they hit the ground, the instructor flipped over on his back, and he hit the ground first, and Garrett landed on top of him. Uh, amazingly, Garrett survived. The instructor was immediately killed. But he took the brunt of the fall so that Garrett might live. You know, that's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. He took the brunt of sin for us. He took our place. He reversed positions with us to pay for our sin that we might be able to live. Now, now why did he do this? Because he knew that he would be able to handle it. See, he was able to handle it because he was perfection. He lived a perfect life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that's a picture of Jesus covering us with himself, so that whenever God looks at us, he doesn't see my unrighteousness, he sees the covering of the perfect Jesus over me. So there's, there's a process that comes with forgiveness. first part is confession. We confess our sins. The second part is substitution, where Jesus takes our place. But then here's the third part of the process for forgiveness. It's cleansing. And that's, again, verse number 9. It says, if we confess our sins, it says he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. And then it says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, if you have a, a nasty cut on your arm and you, and you recognize that cut, you can look at it and you can see that, that it might be bleeding. Uh, you might see that there's some irritation around that cut. And, and it's always good when you recognize and notice a cut. It's, it's good to recognize that you need help. But if that cut is going to get better, if it's going to heal, then it has to be cleaned. I mean, you can recognize anything all day long, but if you don't do anything about it, then there's going to be an infection that sets in. Now, the same thing is true with sin in our lives. You know, sin is a cut that's in your life and my life. And whenever we recognize our sin, it's, it's a good thing to recognize it. It's, it's a good thing to understand that, that we need help with that sin. But for it to experience healing, then there has to be a cleansing that comes with it. Now, too many of us try to handle the cut of sin on our own. And we, we look at some of the sin that we have in our lives and, and we think, well, I'm, I'm going to try to take care of this myself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do so many good things that it's going to take care of that cut. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to church more. Or I'm going, to, I'm going to give an offering to the benevolence fund at the church. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things. Those are, those are good things, but those things don't clean up the cut of sin in your life. You can't clean yourself because it's like you, you're working with dirty tools trying to clean something up. But God's hands are pure, and he has the power to remove the stain of sin. So the Bible says, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, faith in him. Uh, this doesn't come from yourselves. It's God's gift, not from your works so that no one can boast. Now, there's both good news and bad news that comes with this. Let me start with the bad news. Bad news is I can't handle, I can't handle cleaning myself up from my sin. And that, that's frustrating because I don't like to rely on other people to do things for me. You know, I like to handle things all by myself. You know, I'd like to think that I can read a book and make myself better. Or I can listen to a sermon and then, and then my life's going to be better. That, that's just not the way that it works. And it's tough to come to that conclusion but here's the good news. The Bible says that God can actually cleanse you from your sin. The word cleanse in our text here, it means to free you from sin, to free you from guilt or any other defilement. In other words, God has the ability to eradicate the power of sin from your life. He can give you freedom from the power of sin. Now, now let me give you an example of what happens whenever you try to bring freedom or try to clean yourself up all on your own. Uh, probably the, my, the, the car that I've owned that I've enjoyed the most is a 2010 
GT Mustangs, black. I just got, I just sold it last year. And it brings a tear to my eye when I think about that. But I love that car. Um, it was a black car. I, every Saturday, I'll tell you what I did. And, and because it was black, it, it made it really easy to see it when it would get dirty. So I would wash it every Saturday. You know, I'd, I'd get the soap out. I would towel dry it. I would vacuum out the inside of it. And after I did it, it was a, it was a beautiful car. Uh, but here's what I, I learned very quickly. I had to do that every Saturday because during the week, it would just get dirty again. And I would do the best I could to keep that car from getting dirty. You know, I'm, I'm the person that whenever there is a puddle in the road after I wash my car, I would drive into another lane of oncoming traffic to avoid the puddle. Um, whenever I lived in Long Creek, you know, people would have their water sprinklers going. And there's some people, their water sprinklers actually would, would spray right into the road. And I, I don't, this is not in the Bible, but if you have water sprinklers like that, you might not go to heaven. And so I would see them shooting out into the road, and I would drive around it, and then, you know, just be, be frustrated at those people. But it didn't matter how careful I was. The car would always end up getting dirty. Well, the same thing happens to us spiritually. I mean, we make a decision that we're going to be different. You know, I'm not going to talk the same way that I do. I'm going to be, I'm going to be nicer to people. I'm going to, I'm going to read my Bible more. And, and we can do those things, and it, it can go well for a while. But what you begin to notice after a period of time is that you just sort of got the muck of life and this world all over you again. So the question is, well then, how can I be cleaned in a way where it's lasting? Well, the only way it's going to happen is if you are washed by the cleansing power of Jesus. You have to allow Jesus to cleanse you. You know, Jesus told his disciples, he said, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Now, whenever Jesus cleans you, then the question is, how long does that last? Well, it lasts forever. It lasts for all time. You see, whenever you come into a relationship with Jesus, you belong to him forever. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, he said, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In Romans 8, when you get to the very end of Romans 8, it says that there's nothing that can separate us from God. We're told in John 10 by Jesus himself, he said, there is no one or there is nothing that can snatch us out of the hand of God. Now, does that mean we'll never sin again? That's not what it means. I can tell you right now, I, I still struggle with sin. So then exactly what is it that Christ does? He covers me. And because he covers me and because I follow him and I love him whenever I sin, I will confess my sin to Jesus and Jesus promises me that when I confess and turn away from it, that he will provide forgiveness. Now, my guess is that there, there are some of you who, who deal very often in your life with regrets. And you try to figure out, how in the world can I, how can I be free from those things I know, that I've, I know that I've done in my past that are wrong? How can I find freedom from it? And you, and, and you struggle on your own, but then you come to a passage of Scripture like we see today, and you find out God will forgive. And there's a process, though, that, that comes with forgiveness. It is confession, substitution, and then cleansing. Now, are you, are you ready to receive the forgiveness of God? Would you like to experience that in your life? Then if you, if you would like to experience that, let me encourage you to do something. Right where you are right now, just bow your head and talk to God and pray this prayer or something like it after me. Just simply talk to him and, and pray and say, Jesus, I confess my sin to you today. And I ask you to forgive me of that sin. Lord, I recognize I have stepped outside of your boundaries. I'm sorry. Lord, I'm trusting that your perfect life and sacrifice for me on the cross will cover over my unrighteousness. And I'm believing you will never forsake me because I'm asking you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer or something like it, I want you to do something for me. You can take your phone out. And if you would, just text, fear not, to 94090. And there will be a form there that you just simply fill that out 
and we will be able to get you some information in the mail about growing in a walk with Jesus. Now, others of you are believers, you're followers of Jesus. But maybe even though you're a follower of Jesus, you've been plagued by doubt concerning the power of God's forgiveness in your life. Let me encourage you with this. God's word is true. And he says that he forgives. And so let me challenge you today to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I have confessed my sin And when you say that you forgive, I'm going to relax in your promise. You see, when God gives a promise, he always keeps it. And the promise of God that we've looked at today is God is faithful to forgive. I hope that you are encouraged and blessed by that promise of God. God bless you and you have a good week.